Hello, good evening everyone and welcome to this National Education uh, Union Zoom this evening. We're going to be start, starting shortly. Um, this is just a reminder that this call is being live streamed on, on social media um, so that people are, are aware. We also have a number of accessibility features on this call, including subtitles. You can turn them on at the bottom of your, the bottom of your screen by pressing closed captions. We also have Nikki Evans and uh, Anne-Marie providing BSL interpretation this evening for those who need it. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please do um, put a note in the in the in the chat or in the question box. And a member of the NEU team that's working behind the scenes will be able to assist you this evening. Um, but then I will now hand over to Jenny, who is the, the chair for this evening's event. Thank you. Hi, thanks very much, and a big welcome to everybody. Um, this is COP and Beyond, and we are the National Education Union, which um, is at the forefront of campaigning for um, climate change education in all of our schools. Um, I'm Jenny and I'm a teacher in a special school in London, um, a joint district secretary of the NEU and an NEU executive member. Um, and I've been campaigning for a number of years on climate related issues and belong to a number of environmental campaign groups as well as standing recently as a Green Party candidate. Um, we've got a really great lineup for you today, um, which is a mixture of student and youth activists, lobbyists and campaigners um, who've all been working tirelessly, especially in the run up to COP26 on uh, climate change campaigning. And they all share our desire as a union to educate the truth about what is happening to our planet and our children's futures. Just before um, we hand over to them, um, I'd just like to alert you to, um, we will be posting in the chat if it hasn't already happened, our code of conduct for Zoom meetings in the NEU. So we'd be grateful if you'd have a quick look at that and adhere to it. Um, we'd also like to encourage everybody that's on the call um, who's a member of the NEU to sign up to our NEU Climate Change Network and details of that will be posted in the chat as well. And also um, to look through the learning resources that have been provided by the NEU and um, some of the other organisations that we work with, which can be used in our schools. Um, so we have quite um, a substantial list of speakers lined up. So I'm going to um, hand over to them in a minute. And we would just ask everyone if they could please try to keep their speeches to around five minutes, um, because it would be great if we have time for some question and, and answers and a bit of a discussion afterwards. So first of all, I'm going to hand over to um, Jess and Susie. Hi there, I hope everyone can hear me all right. Um, so I'm Susie and I'm the Bucks representative for the UK SSN and I'm going to COP26. I never thought I'd be able to say that, but um, it really just happened out the blue. Um, it was on the 27th of September. I received a text message from my teachers, Miss Mason, and she said that the Aylesbury High School student had to pull out from the Glasgow trip and asked if she wanted to put my name forward. I instantly replied and went, yes, sign me up, sign me up. Um, and just since then, this it's just been a magical experience. It's, um, it's a one in a lifetime opportunity. I can't put it any other way. And um, in, so basically with COP itself and in the run to COP, we've got this um, Teams network and we've just been communicating and collating information and like thinking about our aims for COP as the UK SSN. And well, to be honest, we've all got our own individual schools and like collective aim and it is in the works, but from a personal point of view, I think like I want to focus on the education and awareness of COP and just the environmental stuff. Like I take media studies and there is this one theory called the um, it's called the cultivation theory and basically what it is is where you have ideologies that are drip fed into your everyday life so you then start believing that and I believe if that happens in terms of climate change then I think we will have a bigger impact. So COP itself 
uh, with the UK SSM. We're going um, from the 4th to the 7th of November, but it's 20, 16 to 18 year olds. We're from 12 different regions, all from different schools. So this is like the first time we're properly meeting each other. We will study different things, but we've got one thing in common and that's climate action. And we have got like the best opportunity at COP. We have the opportunity to go to like fringe events and do media interviews, um, make blogs, run social media accounts. Um, we've got a series of meetings with international youth activists. Um, and to top it all off, we're all going to be walking around as like a with an art gallery. We've all got these amazing, unique designs and t-shirts that um, we will wear all around the, like, the site. And they've all been designed by people um, who are like passionate about the climate. And it's basically this, this idea of being a bit of a walking art gallery is really like cool for me. But um, we've got the opportunity to go in like the big green zones and the blue zones as well. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And um, I'm already started packing and getting everything sorted. And um, I really hope this is an eye opening experience not for just myself actually going, but just for people all across the world. So thank you. Um, you you've just reminded me why it's always great to have young people um, in our meetings, Susie, because you're such, you know, so full of optimism and enthusiasm and we all need a bit of that. So thank you. That's great. Um, I've got to apologise because you were supposed to have a, a grand introduction before you started speaking and we didn't squeeze in in time. So I'm going to ask Jessica to do the introduction after you've spoken instead. So over to Jessica. I, I wasn't expecting to speak. It was all it was all up to Susie. So <laughs> don't think you want boring old me. Um, but yeah, no, it's um, I think Susie's summed it up really well. Um, and we've got students from all over. So yeah, Susie's from the Bucks School Sustainability Network, one of our newer networks. Um, and she's in year 13. Um, and it's great to have her on board. So she'll be working with students from 12 different regions, um, all uh, different schools, um, different backgrounds, as she said, studying all different things, different interests, but like minded in wanting to make a difference. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be amazing to we've got 10 staff as well supporting um, from all over the place. It's going to be amazing um, seeing them all getting to know each other in this sort of once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, we've got a meeting with um, Kevin booked in. Um, and lots of other um, people. So that in and of itself um, will be brilliant. Um, and yeah, it's um, being funded by the actual trips being funded by the Royal Society of Chemistry. Uh, so shout out to them and Global Action Plan are supporting um, because I work um, with them as head of youth networks. Um, so yeah, but I think, you know, Susie's summed it all up. Um, we've got we've got a remote team of students as well, about 35 students um, from year 10 to 13, um, who are all contributing and taking part in online things as well. Uh, so thank you, Susie. Thank you so much to both of you and thanks for making the time to come and speak to us as well, Susie. I know you're a very busy person and you're um, probably rushing off before our questions and answers, but thank you so much for speaking to us. Um, before we bring in um, Kevin Courtney, um, I believe there's a film that we can show now, which is a message from Sadiq Khan, um, the London Mayor, about climate change and sustainability. I want to start by thanking the NEU for the work that you do to support people, particularly young Londoners, to help tackle the climate emergency. The climate emergency is the greatest challenge of our time, and it requires leadership at every level, local, city, national and global. And I'm determined to use London's leadership of this movement to inspire and accelerate the climate action that's desperately needed. As Mayor of London, I've committed to making our capital a zero carbon city by 2030. At City Hall, 
we've introduced policies to improve the quality of air around our schools. We're turning our black taxis and buses green. And there are now five times more dedicated cycle lanes in London. We're retrofitting thousands of homes and putting millions of pounds into green businesses. The ultra low emission zone has cut toxic pollution in the city centre by half. And this week, we expanded the zone up to the north and south circular roads, making it 18 times larger. ULES is a world first. It shows that bold action can work. At COP26, countries have the opportunity to take bold action too and choose a path that leads us to a brighter future, one that's greener, fairer and more prosperous for all. Thank you for all that you do. Okay, hope, hope everybody could see and hear that okay. Um, thanks to Sadiq Khan for recording that message, another busy person who's, who's obviously doing um, other things today, but um, we're grateful for that message. Um, would, we would just like to see other cities doing the same as what is being rolled out in London with regards to green transport. So it's my pleasure now to introduce our Joint General Secretary of the NEU, Kevin Courtney, who, along with other trade union leaders, um, is at the forefront of advocating for greater priority to be re uh, placed on climate education, greater resources to go towards climate education, because we recognise as a union and as trade unions in general, the pivotal role that education plays in building towards a greener future. So over to you, Kevin. Thank you very much, Jenny. I'm really pleased to be on this call with you, with fantastic Susie and, uh, and other campaigners. And I want to say something about how our government should act, something about how our members could act, and something in praise of our students. There is so much responsibility on our government in the run-up to the COP. And last week, alongside NAS, UWT, UCU and Unison, and I think it's really important that the unions start to act together. We wrote to Nadim Zahawi, urging him to take urgent action to ensure that climate change education does become fully embedded in the education system. And this is an area where the UK should be leading by example to bring about changes for a more sustainable future, and all the more so as it's the chair of the COP. Now, during COVID, we have lived through, still living through an emergency, and we've seen that governments can make big decisions, should make big decisions. The dire impact of climate change on the future of the young people that we are educating requires an emergency response, a response bigger than the response that we had over COVID on insulation, on green energy, on a just, a just transition in our country, on international development and a just transition internationally, but also crucially, including the education sector. And I mean, it's a, such a truism, but it's our young people who have the most to lose. It's their generation that is gonna bear the brunt of our generation and our governments in action. So we all need to play a part in ensuring a sustainable future for our young people. School and college educators can play a huge part, but the UK government needs to act and give us the space. It needs to ensure that quality climate change education is embedded across the curriculum, as well as on focusing on decarbonizing our schools and our transport to school by 2030. But I think that so far, neither our government nor others around the world have properly grasped the urgency and the gravity of the situation in any sphere, and certainly not in education. The NEU is part with the NAS, UWT and UCU actually, of Education International, an international grouping of education unions. They produced a report card looking at the national determ nationally determined contribution, something the government present for the COP. And on that, the, they rank the UK, they, they say no countries, is doing enough.
but they rank us as 42nd out of 73 countries in terms of preparation for education. So we are saying there needs to be a lot more, a comprehensive review of the entire curriculum. So it's preparing our young people to mobilize the whole of society for a sustainable future. And I tell you, I know that lots of children are frightened about climate change, and you can see why talking about it can ease the fear we can get into i mean it doesn't it doesn't take the fear away but if you start to act on something you're frightened about it's more comfortable and as an interim measure we want jim knight's private members bill restoring sustainability as a pillar of the curriculum to come in straight away we want a comprehensive plan to decarbonize the education estate by 2030 that should be part of a long overdue refurbishment and repair program, which can also remove asbestos at the same time and improve the quality of our buildings. We really need a detailed policy on green travel. Now, all those things need to happen. The DFE Sustainability Unit is announcing its strategy going forward on Friday of next week in the middle of the COP. The Secretary of State will be there. Uh, I would really like to be able to do some social media on that day, some uh, interviews welcoming what they say. Let's wait and see, though. There is so much more that they need to do. We're supporting the demands of teach the, teach the Future, specific, detailed demands on things the government could do. But I just want to say, so those are demands we're putting on government. Educators, we can start to act from below. There are so many educators already preparing teaching resources, engaging with their classes, They've got stories to tell. We can share the materials. We can use that to encourage more students to be active. So I'd urge you as an educator to join the NEU's Climate Change Network. That's NEU Climate Network, all one word, at gmail.com. Join that network and be part of it with us. We know that our students are showing the way. It's not, I mean, it's Greta Thunberg, but it's not just it's not just Greta, fantastic as she is, young people all over our country, like Susie, showing the way forward and mobilizing. They'll mobilize for more student strikes. We need to be with them, supporting them, making sure that we're fighting for the space on the curriculum. It's the challenge of our lifetimes and we have to rise to it. Thanks for being on the call. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Kevin. Um, great call to action there, direct action in the classroom. Um, it's up to us to get those resources out and start teaching them and support our students in school that are striking over climate change as well. Thanks very much for that. Um, I've just noticed that um, Jamie has posted in the chat um, the link to the Teach the Future organisation as well. So I'd encourage everybody to to sign up with them, have a look at that, very useful um, resources and um, partnership there. Um, so the next person that I would introduce, I think the next person on my list is Jamie from SOS UK. Is is he here or are we? Um, I've seen if we could just move on to Donna, is J Jamie probably right. on screen That's in a minute. Right. OK, so instead, I'm going to introduce Donna Hume, who we can already see. And Donna Hume is head of campaigns at an organisation called C40, um, which is a bunch of um, cities all over the world campaigning for a Green New Deal and to make the world's biggest cities sustainable. Um, previously to this, she worked as a campaigner at Friends of the Earth. So over to Donna. Thank you very much um, and thank you for, for having me here. Um, as, as you mentioned, C40 brings together uh, 100 of the world's biggest cities to act together on climate change and uh, we're really pleased this week to have um, Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, as the new chair of the organisation. Um, I was kind of asked to talk a little bit about um, where we are kind of on the overall climate situation with COP about to start and, and, and what can we do about it. And I, I think, you know, speaking about young people leading the way, um, it is obviously not all just uh, Greta, but I think Greta did put it most uh, succinctly last week when she said that we are totally failing to even reach targets that are completely insufficient in the first place. You know, we're on track for 2.7 degrees of global warming if our existing targets are fully met. But actually, it's over three degrees um, if you look at the, the funding and the policies that are in place to, to deliver it. 
Um, that means that emissions are going to rise or are currently on track to rise by 16% this decade, when we know that they need to fall at least by half. And this is really catastrophic for humanity. But I think some of the problem that we've got is if you look at some of the recent coverage, you, you might be forgiven for thinking um, that this problem is solved in the global north. There's been a huge amount of talk about how, you know, it's all fine because the G7's got net zero targets for 2050 and it's the global south members of the G20 that have to step up. I think there are two problems with this. You know, firstly, we don't need action by 2050. We need action right now. So the, the mayors of C40 cities are already committed to science-based targets to achieve their fair share of having emissions by 2030. But what we really want to do um, at COP and beyond is to move the political focus uh, to even more immediate action to reduce emissions. I think the biggest test right now for any government's green credentials is whether their economic stimulus, whether their budgets are supporting the huge investment we need to deliver a green and just transition and what will happen as a consequence to emissions in the next 12 months. You know, the reason that the International Energy Agency is predicting emissions are going to rise 5% next year is because the economic recovery um, insofar as we've had one as, as lockdowns have been eased has been fossil fueled. You know, only 2% of recovery spending has been invested in clean energy. Meanwhile, according to the IMF, just last year, coal, oil and gas production received 5.9 trillion globally in public support. Uh, you know, we need the trillions that are being invested right now to be directed to a green transition, to the creating of green jobs and a just transition for everyone, um, or 1.5 really will be put out of reach. Um, you know, C40 has done some great work on the huge opportunity to invest in city climate action plans, also delivering public services that everybody needs and will improve quality of life from green and expanding public transport, creating more energy efficient housing, lowering people's bills and restoring nature. Doing that would in the C40 cities alone would create 50 million jobs. The second kind of problem um, uh, with this characterization that I wanted to raise is that it just doesn't take into account the different starting points that different countries are at, you know, both in terms of historic responsibility but and capacity, but also even just current emissions. I think we always have to remember that it's those that have done least to cause the climate crisis that are set to suffer most from the impacts. This is true of Global South countries that are going to be subject to worse droughts, extreme heat and weather, but it's also true within countries, um, you know, including Britain, where economic inequality and environmental injustice go hand in hand with deprived communities suffering more pollution. You know, eight million people are dying every year around the world prematurely because of polluted air. I think in this context, talking about the percentage reduction of carbon emissions, you know, can be really misleading. I think that, you know, most people find it hard to keep a handle on, you know, this percentage reduction from that and, and, and this from the other and know whether or not and who is doing enough, actually. And I think it can be more useful and uh, to help demystify the situation to talk about absolute numbers. So C40's modelling shows that on average, each person should be emitting uh, just over two tonnes of carbon per year per person in 2030. Today in Britain, we emit about eight tonnes of carbon, so about four times as much as we need to, where we need to be, a similar level to the EU and a similar level to China. In the US, it's more like 16. In Indonesia, it's more like 2.3. And in India, it's about one and a half. So when we are told that the problem is solved in Britain because we've got these great targets and that the issue is India or Indonesia, we know that that's just not true. So what can we do about it? I think we have to shift the focus to immediate action now. That means focusing on the action that will reduce emissions within the next year. And one thing that young people have been calling for, which I think they're completely right about, is to have annual carbon budgets so that we're talking about what needs to happen year on year on year. And in addition, we have to be calling on governments to align their financial budgets with these carbon budgets. We're in a climate emergency and every government budget should be a climate emergency budget. You know, it's no use simply relying on private investment to deliver a green economy and at the same time subsidising things like fossil fuels and road building. 
you know, calling for the, I think it's 80 billion of green investment in, in Britain that the TUC and others have done to create millions of green jobs is exactly what's needed alongside stopping the public hands out to fossil fuels. Secondly, we're also calling for an equity and justice centered approach. Global South cities require deeper support to meet their mitigation and adaptation targets. I think we've got to recognize the 100 billion a year, which has been promised by developed countries to developing countries under the Paris Agreement is not only long overdue, but it's also the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's needed. It's also crucial that we have a just transition, which is why C40 is really pleased to be working with the ITUC, with the International Transport Workers Federation and others to call for just transition policies that ensure decent jobs are accessible to everyone and that workers are included in the design of transition and green policies. We're working on a number of just transition pilots in cities around the world from Accra to Warsaw and are really pleased that London is going to be our next pilot city delivering a just transition in practice. And then finally, I think that we have to continue to work together to promote international, intersectional and intergenerational collaboration. Young people have led the way in raising awareness of the climate emergency. The work of the NEU and others in supporting young people and calling for proper education on climate change, I think, is absolutely crucial. Um, C40 has uh, brought together a global youth and mayors forum of young people and mayors around the world to collaborate for the first time and are trying to support cities to roll out youth climate councils to really engage young people and have them participate in the decision making process at city level and I think that there's a lot of scope there to look at how we can be working more closely together with the education unions on some of these really important topics. Uh, climate change is also a Black Lives Matter issue. It will be the world's majority Black population that is most impacted if we don't limit temperatures to 1.5 degrees. Um, I think recognising this is critical to building the alliances we need at COP and beyond across unions, cities, civil society and young people. Do everything we can to come together around the key demands for action now is going to be critical. We're not going to solve it all in the next two weeks at COP, but I'm hopeful that if we work together, uh, we will get there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donna. Um, good call to action there on the uh, reducing the carbon budget and um, lobbying on, on issues to do with cutting emissions. Um, I know that we've uh, got a relevant question on that, just gone into the Q&As. Um, just a reminder for everybody, um, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions or items that you want to raise for discussion, please post them in there. And we're hoping to have time to do that when the speakers are finished. Also, just to um, point out, Kevin and Emily have, have just posted details in the chat of the demos that are taking place on the 6th of November in different regions across the country, as well as Glasgow um, in that sort of middle weekend of COP26. So um, thanks, Donna, um, for that. And I'm now very pleased to welcome um, Jamie Agomba from SOS UK. Um, Jamie previously worked as Head of Sustainability at National Union of Students. Um, he's now the executive director of SOS UK, which stands for Students Organising for Sustainability UK. And this is a new educational charity created by the NUS in response to the climate emergency and ecological crisis. So over to you, Jamie. Thanks, Jenny. Yes, I, I, I won't need to go into too much about SOS UK because you kindly did that for me, but we're quite a new charity and we're trying to respond to the climate emergency and the ecological crisis as quickly as we can on behalf of the 7 million students that NUS represents. Just wanted to quickly say a little bit about Teach the Future. I posted the link to it in the channel, uh, in the chat box a little while ago. Teach the Future is one of the campaigns we support, supporting young people to call for the repurposing of the whole education system around the climate emergency. At the moment, Climate change is siloed into just a few subjects, which is quite dangerous. Young people think that uh, climate change is just something that is there to be sorted out by geographers and scientists, which clearly is not the case. It's going to impact every young person's future, whatever their career. So we're trying to influence how the Department for Education thinks about climate, trying to weave it through everything that's taught a little bit like equality is. Uh, equality isn't a subject, you're taught things in an equal way. We believe that you should be taught things at a sustainable rate, regardless of what you're being taught. 
So for 18 months, we tried to get a meeting with the Secretary of State for Education in England and failed. Um, and then recently we got a meeting with Gavin Williamson three days before he was sacked. So that wasn't particularly useful to us. But um, something interesting has happened in the Department for Education. They've set up a climate change and sustainability unit. I suspect this is a, a result of the pressure put on by good organisations like the NEU and ourselves and others. I suspect also that they were leaned on quite heavily by the Cabinet Office, um, asking them what they would do in relation to COP. However, regardless of why this unit's been set up, we're really pleased that it has been set up. It's got some excellent civil servants working in it, and we've got to know those civil servants over the last few months. Um, they, they're predominantly working on a strategy, as Kevin alluded to earlier, which is being released on the 5th of November publicly with a launch event on the 6th of November. And we and others, um, presumably NEU and many of the education trade unions have been influencing what will go into that strategy. It's going to be launched as a consultation. Um, we're expecting it not to give us everything that we want, quite far from that. I think that they'll probably not give us much that we want. I suspect the focus will be on greening campuses uh, and uh, estates, school estates, um, you know, meeting their net zero targets by 2050, rather than the interesting stuff around teaching and learning, which is so critical. So there's a fantastic opportunity for us all to help um, shape that further in response to the consultation. And we think we'll have from the middle of November, probably through to the middle of January, to work together and to support you, for you to support us, for us to actually come up with some evidence-based reasons for why their consultation uh, should be improved and their draft strategy should be strengthened. So we're looking forward to working with you on that. One thing I should say is that the Department for Education are doing some interesting work now, actually, at COP. Um, and one of the events that we're working with them on is an Education Minister's Summit, uh, which is on the 5th of November in the Blue Zone. We're actually the official youth partner for that um, through Teach the Future and also our Mock COP initiative. Uh, and we've been working with them to try and make that event as ambitious as possible. So far, there's about 30 ministers of education from around the world who have said they're going to participate. And each of them has been asked to make a pledge. Uh, we would much rather it had been a declaration where we can set out um, some very ambitious asks and countries sign up to that. Um, but working with UNESCO, the Italian government and the UK government, we ended up with a pledge scheme. So we're now working to try and get those pledges to be as ambitious as possible. Also that those pledges will be dated um, so that we can hold those politicians to account and ensure that they deliver uh, what they've said they're going to do rather than just give us some more promises. Um, the other one that I wanted to just tell you about, and it's something you can all join actually, I'm not sure if you've, any of you have heard of our Teach the Teacher initiative, which came from Teach the Future. So Teach the Teacher, was a month long campaign we ran this month where we support young people to teach their teachers how to teach climate because predominantly governments haven't invested in the reskilling of teachers. We did a survey um, through Teach the Future of UK educators last year, and it was about 2000 educators completed it. And it was only eight out of 10 said that they had formerly been reskilled on climate. Um, uh, and there's a real desire for, uh, for teachers and tutors and lecturers to build this into the curriculum content but they say they have a lack of confidence to do that so in the absence of the government doing what we want them to do around teach the future which is to invest a load of money in the reskilling of teachers and to create a new professional teaching qualification for educators um, we've started to do that ourselves and due to the positive relationships we've now got with the department for education's climate change and sustainability unit we're actually on the 4th of November uh, running a live stream of Teach the Teacher in the UK government's Generation Z sort of net zero model classroom that they've got up in Glasgow. The audience in person is going to be fascinating. So the two teachers will be 17 year old jo Jody and 18, sorry, 19 year old Phoebe. And they're actually going to be educating the permanent secretary, the director general of the Department for Education the Children's Commissioner, um, somebody senior from the US government, and hopefully some people from the Scottish government and a couple of the vice chancellors from Scottish universities, uh, and also somebody senior from Education International too. 
um, the Deputy General Secretary. So we're really pleased that we're going to make um, hopefully a mark on those senior civil servants and they'll actually understand what it's like to be a young person in a climate emergency and ecological crisis, what eco-anxiety is um, and what climate justice is and how, most importantly, it can be woven in. If anyone has any examples of how teachers have embedded this into non-geography or science classes, predominantly in secondary education, so how people have made the link into religious studies or economics or um, arithmetic and mathematics, English literature, really love to see that in the chat box because we can actually mention that you can cite the name of the school in our pledge uh, in our uh, teach the teacher um, event on the fourth if anyone wants to join that event it will be live streamed on the department for education's youtube channel and again the time for that is one o'clock on thursday the 4th of november and the content will be appropriate for teachers but also for pupils in secondary school as well um, there's no need to book you can just join that just to conclude, really, um, we're really pleased the Department for Education has set up this Climate Change and Sustainability Unit. We really think that their draft strategy won't be as ambitious as we all want it to be. We'll focus on buildings uh, and um, physical uh, responses to the climate emergency and less on the teaching and learning. So I'd really like to work with you all on the consultation responses and encourage you to look out for that announcement when it comes on the 5th of November. The last thing I'll just say is that we've also got um, a new COP26 educators pledge, but we've only had about 90 educators completed since we launched it last week. But if you're an educator and you'd like to complete the pledge to integrate climate into your teaching, or if you're a teacher trainer, or you teach um, educators uh, at college or university level as well, please do complete the pledge. And that's your own personal way of saying that you won't wait for government to get around to support you to do this you'll get on and do it yourselves thank you thank you jamie um this meeting is so um useful and informative um there's so many initiatives going on and sort of starting all the time as well in the run-up to cop 26 and i think it's really useful for people to come here and get all these links and and to sort of keep that going afterwards somebody actually said to me just before the meeting oh are you going to another meeting where you're preaching to the converted and I thought, well, no, actually, it's not about preaching to the converted. It's about people informing each other and boosting each other up in the work that they're doing. And I think those things are, are very useful. Um, somebody that's very good at doing that is going to speak next. Um, and this is Suzanne Jeffrey, who um, lots of you will know because she's part of the COP26 Trade Union Coalition um, and is chair of the Campaign Against Climate Change Trade Union Group campaigning for a just transition and a green economy for workers. So I'll hand over to Suzanne now. Great, thank you, Jenny. Um, and also just to add to my little introduction, um, a history teacher and an NEU member. So I'm very, very proud of my union um, uh, for organizing this meeting and for the work that we're doing around mobilizing for COP26 for COP and, and beyond. Um, I hope we're not talking to the converted. I hope we are doing something um, important and significant. And we're using this opportunity to go forward and amplify, uh, amplify our voices. And I very much want to agree uh, with the comments that Donna made earlier. All the contributors have been absolutely fantastic, but Donna hit so many nails on the head in her contribution. I really thank you for that, Donna. Uh, because what's at stake is, is huge and enormous um, around COP26 and, and beyond. And uh, I just want to return to some of the figures um, that Donna rightly sort of broke down for us a little bit. But what needs to happen? We need to stay below 1.5 degrees of warming. And that means something. It isn't just a figure. Um, if we're able to stay below 1.5 degrees, which increasingly looks harder and harder because of the inaction that we are seeing. But if we're not able to do that, the, the consequences are devastating. Um, they're devastating in terms of lives. Millions of people will, will, will find it difficult to live. Um, 
hundreds of thousands of millions will lose their lives, they'll lose their livelihoods. And I think we're all beginning to realize, we're all beginning to have some kind of lived reality of what a changing climate looks like, uh, from floods in London to seeing just across the channel in Germany, those devastating floods in some of the richest parts of the world, um, economies and infrastructures not able to cope. And that's before we even start thinking about uh, the, 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 the global south and, and, and as Donna rightly said, people who have contributed the least but suffering the greatest impacts, but with an infrastructure often that finds um, handling the problems much, much more challenging and even in, as I say, our part of the world, incredibly challenging um, to deal with those circumstances. So we need to, we need to meet these targets and um, the Paris Agreement, which is now um, followed through to COP26, and it's worth mentioning, we are talking COP26. So this is the 26th year that the conference of the parties, the governments who have agreed to tackle the problem have met to do something about it. And yet clearly, you know, the response um, over those 26 years, those quarter of a, uh, a century has been utterly, utterly inadequate. We're supposed to be ratcheting up um, at, COP20, at COP26 to keep us on track. 1.5 degrees. I want to remind people when students and young people took to the streets um, in 2018, uh, in 2019 I should say, they did so in response to the IPCC special report of 2018 and the IPCC special report of 2018 said by 2030 we have to have reduced global emissions by 50% to, to, to meet that target. It's now nine years um, away from 2013 and instead even with a pandemic and even with the lockdowns that took place, emissions go in the opposite, in the opposite direction. So I think really I want to say three, three things. Um, one is to pick up on the comment about our own government. Um, it's not sufficient to shift the blame um, to other parts of the world. Our own government will, 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 will claim it's a global climate leader uh, because of the emissions targets um, that they have 78% reduction in emissions uh, by by 20 by 2035, but we have to look at what plans are in place to meet those emission targets. And when we look at what plans are in place, we see a litany of failure, um, even on the most simple of levels, insulating our homes. Uh, that green homes plan in which the Lots of, uh, of, of public sector money was, was shoveled in the direction of that, but with very little impact. Uh, very few homes insulated, and now the plan has been that plan has been closed down. And over and over again, when we look at the plans in place, they don't match the target. Even their own committee on climate change has said that even with the current plans that the government have, that would only reduce one fifth of the emissions that the uh, that the government have targeted to meet. So we do also have to look at, you know, what do we need to do? And it is about thinking about plans that um, challenge uh, inequality and challenge poverty at the same time as tackling the climate, the climate crisis. And the transitions that we need to make are right across society. I think it's important that we, we stop thinking simply about, although this is very important, simply about transitioning the energy sector, but it's how do we transition all the other parts of our society, our transport system, our homes, our education system, investing in a caring, a caring economy, replenishing nature, restoring nature, um, and how do we get our food? How do we produce our food, our food sustainably? So when we talk about education and skills, we're talking about real investment in all those sectors of the economy that young people are equipped to play their part in solving the climate crisis um, in a huge expansion of public sector uh, jobs and in a, a real transformation of how we organize our society to meet the climate crisis and really reduce our emissions. So I think the final point I want to make is about the COP26 uh, protests um, themselves. It is a trade union issue. It's a trade union issue and we need to stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters globally on November the 6th. Um, Kevin posted in the chat earlier on about the demonstrations. I think it's really, really important that as trade unionists and as members of the NEU, we are active and visible on those demonstrations. Um, we need to be there to show that it is a working class issue, that it is a trade union issue, but also to raise up 
our demands about the bigger transformation that we need to see in our society if we really are um, able to tackle the climate emergency. And that I think it also is an act of solidarity with the young people um, that took to the streets in 2019 and, and showed us all how urgent and how important it is that we take action and we really, really deliver the transformations that we need as quickly as possible. Thank you, Suzanne. So everybody on the street, 6th of November, um, whatever region you're in, find your nearest one. If there's nothing else you do this year, do that. OK, thanks for that. Um, I'm now going to introduce our final speaker, um, who is Lily Henderson. And Lily is a youth climate activist who's based in Scotland, and she's part of the Teach the Future organisation, which was mentioned earlier a couple of times, which is a student led group advocating for the inclusion of climate education in the curriculum. So um, welcome to Lily. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for inviting me along today. And to start, as Jenny said, I'm Lily Henderson and I'm 17 years old and I'm a youth climate activist based right up in Inverness in the top of Scotland. Um, I started to get involved in activism when I was 14. I was following the school strikes quite closely on social media, but being three and a half hours away from, you know, the central bell, I didn't really take part because I thought I could never get involved in that. Um, a couple of months later, a group of young people from Inverness actually started our own branch of Fridays for Future Highlands. And that's the youth strike movement kind of in Scotland. And I went along to the strike that happened in Inverness, just basically with a bunch of my friends, because we thought it'd be nice to kind of get involved with something. And these types of things never really happen where I'm from. And this really was a great first insight into activism uh, for me. And then a week later, again, I saw on social media that they could, you know, they were looking for more people to help with the school strikes. So I signed up and then together, the small group of us, we planned three more strikes in Inverness. But sadly, due to COVID, our last one had to be cancelled then. And then during lockdown, I had a lot more free time um, as I'd been furloughed from a part time job. And I got involved in our national, you know, Scotland wide team at Fridays for Future Scotland. And I didn't realise that I could be as involved in activism and fighting for climate change from afar, but I am and I still am and I do make it work. And I mean, due to the pandemic anyway, a lot of it was, well, everything had to happen online in the first place. So I got involved in running our social media pages and volunteer wellbeing team. But there's also a lot of other things because I'm sure as you can imagine, as a group of teenagers, everyone really does chip in wherever and it can be a bit chaotic and a bit crazy at times especially during exam seasons um yeah and it's also worth adding in about here that we launched the scottish branch of teach the future as you know jamie was talking about a lot earlier it's the climate education campaign trying to reform it and have the inclusion of climate change in it because you know from my own experience um i'm currently in my last year of high school i'm not entirely sure what the equivalent of that is in england <laughs> i'm sorry but it's but I haven't done it since I was uh, 12. That is ridiculous. That is five years since I've done anything about climate change in, in the classroom. And that's just because I didn't take geography as a subject. And I'm lucky enough that my school offers environmental science, um, but I have to go away to college to do that. So I'm doing it like outside of school, which is really lucky, but that isn't offered in many places or in Scotland at all. Um, yeah, and then going with Teach the Future, we really have made a lot of progress so far, especially in Scotland. Uh, we've been able to, with the manifestos for the election in May, we were able to get our asks included in four of the main political parties in Scotland, which is really, really great progress to see and gives us a really good point to keep lobbying parties, including the SNP, to ensure that we can, uh, Scottish students can get the climate education that we desperately need and desperately deserve. So going back to a bit about Fridays for Future Scotland here, um, we kept organising online actions and did an in-person strike in September 2020 that was very small um, due to the rising COVID cases again. And it was mainly a social media action asking people to send us signs, which was so really good and we got a lot in. And then another lockdown started to happen, but we didn't give up. We got back to planning and in the new year, we changed our name from Scottish, Scottish Youth Climate Strike to Fridays for Future Scotland, as we felt with COP coming to Glasgow, it made sense for us to be a bit more connected to our international counterparts as well, as a lot of them operate under that name too. 
And yeah, so jumping back to last month, we were able to do another protest again with momentum than ever in Glasgow and Edinburgh, Stirling and a couple other places across Scotland as well. And Glasgow even had them was able to do a march uh, for the first time since the big protests that happened in 2019. And we even had the most strikers in the whole of the UK, which is a huge achievement because that's certainly not usually the case. Um, yeah, and I guess talking a bit about COP26 here, it has certainly been a bit of chaos currently with us trying to organise actions and of protests that are, well, it's happening next week now, which I still can't believe. But for us, it's been weeks of organising, months and even years for some of us. But yeah, we're going, we're going to try and make them as big a success as possible. So we're organising an event in the Green Zone called A Conversation with Fridays for the Future, Meet Youth Activists from around the, around the World, sorry. And this will be a panel event with speakers from Scotland, Colombia, Uganda, and Blackistan. And it's taking part, place on the 9th at 1.30 p.m. And it'll also be live streamed as well on the Green Zone website, I think, or YouTube channel. I'm not entirely sure yet. I'm still working out all the final details of that. And I think it is sold out now, but yeah, you were able to get tickets from the, COP26 website but I'm not sure if there's any left it's like I said it's been very crazy past few days and finally we're uh, we're also doing a climate strike on the 5th of November and we are marching from Calvin Grove Park to George Square at 11 a.m and if you're up in Glasgow I would really really encourage you to attend as well alongside the protests that's happening on the 6th and then after we're marching to George Square we'll be having a rally there and, and we'll have speakers of all ages come along, including Greta Thunberg and Chris Mitchell from the GMT, plus many, many more and live music as well. But I think the reason why we're doing this, especially at COP, you know, the pledges that have been made ahead break the Paris Agreement. And that's something that was said has been, you know, this important thing that was going to you know, change the world and everyone's going to follow it. And we're not. And I'm aware I'm the third person that said this tonight. But the current pledges come to 2.7 degrees. 2.7 degrees does not give me a future. We need 1.5 degrees and we need to change this now. COP26 needs to have actions and not pledges, which is what has happened with the Paris Agreement and every other 25 COPs that have happened. So I guess if you take any way, anything away from this, let it be that climate change is not a one person issue. It's everyone's issue. It will impact us in Britain soon. It will impact me in Scotland. It will impact everyone, no, no matter where you are. But it is already impacting a lot of people in the global south. And that's very concerning because they shouldn't be going through these effects now while we all as Western countries sit back and, you know, don't follow our targets and completely miss them or don't even have the correct infrastructure in place. But it is my generation that will live through all of the targets. In 2030, I'll be 27. In 2040, I'll be 37. In 2050, I'll be 47. You, you get the idea. I'm going to live through all of these. So we really do need action at COP and not words. Thank you. Well done, Lily. I mean, the fact that you've achieved so much in, in just three years of your life is testament to how serious an issue this is, in particular for young people, I think. And, and those of us that are older feel it for our children and our grandchildren as well. So well done um, for speaking with such passion about that. And um, I'd encourage everybody to support um, the school students that are coming out on strike on the 5th of November, whether or not you're in Glasgow, even if we can just support on social media, if we're not there physically, I think it all still helps. So thank you for that. Um, I think the sheer amount of information that we're being given and the number of speakers um, that were keen to come tonight and the number of participants we have on the Zoom call and um, on the live stream um, shows what an appetite there is for this work um, in our union. And clearly, we're not going to have time to answer um, all the questions that have come in um, as a result. But I haven't wanted to cut short the speakers because I felt that they were all saying really important um, stuff. But we are going to invite our um, panel back on now. Um, and uh, we do have one question um, that I think we have time to um, just ask for a few comments from each of the panel members, whoever would like to go first. Um, and the question is, in relation to schools, why are we still feeding children in schools meat and dairy 
when science has proven that this is a massive contributor to climate change, meat free Mondays are not enough. Um, why teach children that protein can only be um, gained from eating animals? Um, who would like to come in and um, comment on that question first? Any volunteers from our panel? Okay, Kevin, thank you. Well, do you know, I, I, I agree with the thrust of this question. Um, I heard George Monbiot say a little while ago that if there were two things in your personal life that you could adjust that might make a contribution, it would be going uh, vegetarian or vegan, and it would be giving up flights. He also went on to say, it's not enough, those personal things. We also have to, I think he said, abolish capitalism, but you know, radical changes to the way we organize society. But I think Matthew's question is, uh, is hitting a right issue. I think the question of how you do that is a question, it is about taking people with you. I, I mean, I'm not sure, uh, I, I think meat-free Monday would be a start. I think there's lots of people who don't have any meat-free days in the week, but I do think that, so what I think we should be doing is advocating in school for more uh, cook it, cook it, cookery lessons, I think they should exist in schools, and I think we don't teach children how to cook food enough uh, from the point of view of, of their own uh, health and the food they're eating. And in, in, in the course of that, we should be advocating for, for cooking uh, vegan and vegetarian dishes. I think that will be a way of taking people with you. I do think that we should be talking about free school meals. And I think, I, think, I think we should have free school meals for all children in primary schools. And that would then give us a chance to retool the school estate in order to be providing vegetarian food to children uh, through a free school meals programme. Thank you, Kevin. Jamie, next. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, I agree with that, Kevin. I, I, I don't think you should force this on young people, but I think the way to do it is build into the education system. And there's a brilliant school, uh, school in, um, uh, in Richmond upon Thames, where they have uh, given it a primary school and they've looked at like where the chicken comes from and they found out it came from Thailand because it was cheaper and then the young people didn't want to eat it. I think you should do some critical analysis of where the meat comes from, how it's killed, and then I think the young people will come to their own conclusions. The carbon stuff's also, of course, incredibly valid in that discussion, but I think when people realise how terrible the meat is that they're getting, I think they won't want to eat it anyway. Thank you, Jamie. Quickly, we'll get, get around everybody else. Lily? Um, yeah, I think what both of you have said before me has been very interesting perspectives on it. But from my own experiences, back when I was in primary school, we were looking at food miles of things like eggs and I think possibly some meats as well. And that was a really interesting experience. But the education wasn't there as to why it was important or why it was impacting you know our climate change that our meat was coming from so far away and we weren't picking up from you know a, the local market and I think having that incorporated and really teaching peoples about where their food comes from uh, in that sense and then again linking it back to the climate crisis would be the most effective way there but another thing at least within my school since Covid's happened they've started plastic wrapping everything and it didn't used to do that it used to be able to buy the freshly baked brownies and things as normal and now they're wrapped in plastic and that's not the only thing like that and that's a really concerning you know source of plastic that's coming from our schools and there's no recycling bins either they're just getting littered everywhere and I think it, that's important to remember as well that it's not just meat within our schools that need to change it's how we package them as well that's going to impact on our the carbon footprint and kind of emissions of the schools as well. Mm. Thank you Donna. Yeah, no, thank you. I really agree with everything that's been said. I think Lily's point there about linking it back to climate change is about 13% of emissions from cities come from the uh, consumption of food, and that is mainly meat and dairy. And I just wanted to highlight there's um, a Good Food Cities pledge, and that looks at actually how can we not just rely on individual change, but how can we have system change to do it? And actually starting with... Um, looking at what we can do on, on procurement of, of good quality food uh, in, in our public institutions. I think that is um, 
absolutely critical but then also bringing people with you as some of the other panelists have been saying and, and what can we do to reach out um to engage actually people in some of the um in putting these plans in 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 place is is important too i'll, I'll post a link to the the pledge in the chat thanks thanks, thanks donna and suzanne Suzanne's muted. Could somebody unmute Suzanne? Is, is one of the tech I'm yes. muted. Yeah, thank you. Um, just very quickly on, on this issue um, and following on sort of really from what Lily was saying, I think one of the key issues is the fact that so much of what happens in our school around food is outsourced. So we now have a situation where lots, you know, schools are, are trying to, to find the lowest possible price that they can pay um, in, in terms of the outsourced company that's going to come in and provide the food. And I think that has driven a lot of what Lily was, was talking about, where actually, you know, the, 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 there are certain standards, but the, the type of food that's been served, the packaging, you know, it's kind of moved away from a, a very sort of holistic and, and sustainable approach um, to what we are doing. And it is kind of driven by lowest common denominator, lowest pos possible cost prices, and that's the wrong way to go. So one of the things, you know, is, is alongside everything else that people said, we have to fight really to, to get so much back um, away from, outsource private sector and back into a sort of system where we're thinking about what we need to do rather than what is the lowest possible price that can be paid for something and we lose so much by trying to do that um, and that'd be a big part and we also want to involve the whole school community and making decisions including the young people about what we eat and and how we meet and that's a big part of what's missing in our schools as well but end privatization of so much of what we do in schools that would be a big step forward in terms of being able to achieve some of the things that we're talking about here tonight. I think although we don't have um, time to take more questions, I think pretty much similar answers would come to um, other questions that would have been asked because the answer to most things is education and completely overhauling the way that we do it and the privatisation that's become part of it and, and all the rest of it. Um, so this meeting was called COP and Beyond and yes, we all have hope for what might happen at COP, but we all know that we're going to have to redouble our efforts on campaigning beyond COP because we know what kind of government and what kind of world leaders we're dealing with. And we suspect that they may leave us as disappointed as they left us with the budget yesterday, the budget which ignored the carbon budget completely. Um, I'd like to say thank you to all the staff that have supported with this call tonight, um, Nikki and Anne-Marie for the signing, um, Mike and Matt doing the tech behind the scenes, Emily, Sarah, Patrick and all the other staff whose names I've missed off who've been supporting um, behind the scenes to run this call. Um, which has been so important. And um, a big thank you to our speakers, the ones that have had to leave early or send videos in, but also Jamie, Donna, Suzanne, Lily and Kevin. Thank you so much um, for being here and um, helping everybody to understand what an important issue this is and that COP is the beginning, not the end, and that we need to carry on with our campaigning. Um, just a reminder to everybody to please sign up to our climate change network in the NEU. Um, the, its next meeting will be held in January to talk about what to do next after COP. Um, please get your districts to sign up for the NEU Climate Networks model conference motion, which will be amended in the wake of COP according to what happens afterwards. Um, and then also, continue to join all of our collective voices as we hold the schools minister to account on a statement that they made yesterday, which was not reported in the midst of the announcement of the cheaper Prosecco. Um, but when Parliament held a debate yesterday on climate change and sustainability, this is what the schools minister said. I want us to do more to educate our children about the costs of environmental degradation. Not only do our children deserve to inherit a healthy world, but they also need to be educated so that they are well prepared to live in a world affected by climate change. Um, amen to that, but let's hold them to account on it. And I think the way to do that is we want to see as many 
big numbers as possible on the streets on the 6th of November. So hopefully see you all there wherever you are. And thank you so much for coming tonight. Thanks, everybody.